in not a lot of ways, point. the Emperor is just playing a massive game of Monopoly when you think about mm. it. Oh, God. I wonder what all the... Uh, if you had to replace like all the names of like the London streets, what would you uh, put there? Probably something... Ula Noor and uh, <laughs> uh, some other planets. Istvan. Macra- 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 is definitely one of the blue ones. The dark blue. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, right. Like, the end. Yeah, like, yeah. Pal Mal. Or... Oh, that's cool. Like, all that expensive shiz. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lore Crimes. It has been some time since we've done the uh, the Timeline podcast, but fear not, we've not forgotten it, because today we're back coming at you live with the Great Crusade. Ooh. And uh, we're going to cover, you know, what, uh, what was going on with that and just uh, this tide of humanity sweeping across the galaxy under the Emperor's banner. I, killing loads of Eldar. I, you know, I tried. I tried to extend a branch with that one and not say something <laughs> sassy. But you had to throw it in. It was unavoidable, was it? Uh, Apparently. Well, before we get on to the, uh, uh, the Imperium's uh, The Rot Beneath the Facade showing quite nicely, as it did in the Great Crusade, uh, why don't I pass it over to Eli with a question of the week before we get this ball rolling? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Last time, we forgot to do a question, but the time before that, we asked you what your lore lies were, and I chose a couple answers. First one isn't funny, but I like it. Uh, It says, the traitors had no reason to keep the second and eleventh secret, but they did anyway. That's kind of true. Yeah. Damn. I guess uh, continuity is not a thing, is it? Doubting <laughs> <laughs> the will of the emperor. How dare you? Apparently. And I, then the next two are like, sorry, go ahead, Cole. So I, I think flouting the will of the emperor kind of went out the window around this time. Yeah. I think by <laughs> no, that point, no, it was no, the, the will of the emperor was the emperor. well and gone. Jeez. Um, okay, then then the next two are absolute heresy. And I hate them, but they're funny, so... This, I forgot, I didn't put down the name of the first one, I'm sorry, but good job to the guy who wrote that. Uh, but this one is from Arrowvit42. The best kept secret in 40k is that the Khan could have left the webway anytime he wanted, but the Drissi is too good in Kamara to leave. <laughs> oh, God. Amen. Hey, yeah. Oh, God, that's targeted. Uh, hey. uh, have you seen that artwork though, where it's Gilliman and it's he's talking to the car and he's got like some some like yeah da- uh, Drukari Eldar ladies. He's just like get in the things, loser. We're gonna go like <laughs> save. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the car. Uh, uh, and then you hear I also had a little extra. Is the best ep- secret in Age of Sigmar is that Felix Ooh. did get revived as a Stormcast, but all of his baby mamas did as well. So that's why no one can find him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, can that be canon? Oh. <laughs> and then E. Doyle said something along the same lines. Uh, the Inquisition doesn't want you to know this, but Jagatai is absent from the city due to his conquering of Jukari witches. So there oh, you go, man. fellas. He's just n- a- like all that Andy today, apparently. His favorite boy. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, well, who, who doesn't like the Khan? I'll tell you who. Losers. There we go. <laughs> Jeez. Tough He's stuff. Been- Accuse him of being lazy. <laughs> the man who's so fast is lazy. The Khan knows Eldar women are the best. <laughs> oh, stop. Okay. Uh, yeah, people are watching this. <laughs> poor, poor listeners. Oh, my goodness. All right. Moving on. We Our went over. next. Oh. Okay. Oh. Our question this week is What is your imperial truth? Use hashtag imptruth uh, in the commas while you're saying it so that we can find it. Let us know the. Uh, Let's see, the, the unwavering truth of Warhammer Make it funny. Make it funny. Make it very funny. Funny the better. Yes. Uh, for example, and... Imperial Truth, the Emperor's a god. Stop pretending he isn't Space Marines. Yeah, we need to get over yeah. that. Very true. <laughs> Alright, so why don't we get to the actual content? And I'll pass it over for the beginner section to Mr. Howler Andy. I already forgot. 
<laughs> Halorandi is short for Hal, short for Halberd. It's their oh, Handy. Handy. <laughs> conglomeration of Hal and Andy. I'll pass it over yeah. to Handy. There we go. Yeah, that's 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 Greg Rosie. <laughs> Andy is the worst name. <laughs> mm. Okay, so boys, uh, today we'll be talking about perhaps not the not the mediocre, not the average, but the Great Crusade. The humble and crusade. The, humble, the great the, crusade. It was the great good. crusade. Then the mid crusade hey. didn't, didn't get uh, caught on. So this is the great crusade. And if you are new to Warhammer, this is a pretty like foundational war slash event that kind of s- starts the entire setting. So if you hadn't heard of it, uh, that's okay. Uh, if you do know about it, hopefully we'll cover some more details and sort of like general events but we're going to cover it as like a general over arc so not specifically what every legion did because they'll be getting their own video but we'll yeah, kind we'll of go yeah the the, the the big broad strokes and the thing about the great crusade it's, it's kind of like the catalyst it's it's one it's the downfall of humanity but it's also the the start of the resurgence for like the eldar to an extent and then a few thousand years later you get the necron and the tau getting involved and but, you know, chaos starts its, its big purge of, you know, all living things. So it's it's very much where the ball gets rolling for the setting. So uh, going straight into it, we start with the beginner section. So the Great Crusade is itself the foundation of the Imperium of Mankind. So many of the like well-known chapters, legions, figures, they're all sort of born or uh, come to prominence within this sort of time. And it's a period where it lasts about 200 uh, years or just over, I think, 200 years from like start till the beginning of the Horus Heresy where it all goes down the toilet. And we all enjoy that because obviously that's why we're all here. <laughs> so the Great Crusade started as the reconquest of the lost colonies of mankind created by the emperor himself. And this took place in the late 30th millennium. So the Emperor's just on terror. Terror isn't all unified, and now he's like, hmm, stars, rubs his hands together. They're looking a bit sexy, so he's going to go bring them into his little... Uh, <laughs> that's a empire. juicy human colony right there. I want some of that for myself. <laughs> yum, that's, yum. A, that's a nice empire you got there. Be ashamed <laughs> if someone <laughs> conquered it. Would be to lose it. Oh. He dropped his empire card. He looked. Um, so... Yeah. With his armies of millions of mortal soldiers, 20 proto-legions of space marines, and his custodians by his side, the Emperor goes, it's conquest in time. Uh, I mean, in not in a lot of ways, the Emperor is just playing a massive game of Monopoly, when you think about mm. it. Oh, God. I wonder what all the... Uh, if you had to replace like all the names of like the London streets, what would you uh, put there? Probably something... And uh, <laughs> uh, some other places. Macrog Mac- 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 is definitely one of the blue ones. The dark blue. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, right. Like the end. Yeah. Like yeah. Pal Mal. Or, oh, that's cool. Like, all that expensive shiz. Uh, so the Great Crusade began with the conquest of the soul system. So obviously, you know, f- straight out of the gate, he needs his home base. And it begins also with the alliance with the Mechanicum of Mars, the sort of tech priests. Uh, brotherhood that lives upon there. We'll go into more detail about them, probably in their own video actually, but obviously further on in this video too. And as the Great Crusade pushed past the boundaries of the Soul System, like Star System after Star System was just like crunked, and it was all brought into Imperial compliance. So this came from like primitive worlds as well, all the way up to like advanced civilizations of like human colonies. And this was, from what most people don't know, like it's also done through diplomacy as well as war. So it wasn't always that space marines were like, "Yo, get in there, fam." That that world's looking a bit, you know, thirsty for some stomping. Uh, so it was often a lot of diplomatic, you know, lots of preaching from the uh, iterators and the remembrances. Funny enough, <laughs> so we have well, our own. I own mean, remembrance. Some of the planets, yeah, they have nice civilizations, and the other ones are like eating raw meat. And then the Imperium goes, "Hey, would you like a microwave?" It's like, "Oh, of course I would. That's much better than what I, what I have now." You know, microwave yeah. food did birth the Imperium. Uh, mm-hmm. don't, don't the Imperium, bro. 
<laughs> Hot Pockets saved humanity. Yes. Oh, the, ham and cheese, the ham and cheese is the best flavor. Oh my gosh, mm. this is why humanity fell. <gasps> do we even have Hot Pockets in the UK? I don't think we do. I mean, I think we call them hot slices. Is that the same thing? That hot sounds good. Heresy. I mean, is hot it just a, heresy? it's a little, like, not biscuit, but just, like, bread filled with cheese. Like a pastry you just with, like, yeah, a pastry. Yeah. 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 I mean, really yeah. But, okay, people didn't come for their cheese knowledge. They came for their Warhammer. <laughs> they might, have. They might have, like, does the Emperor like Brie? I don't know. Ah, uh, probably. <laughs> Actually, no, he's, he's probably a heretic. So I'm way worse, Ooh. like, Wednesday Dale. Um, so they also spread... Uh, throughout the growing Imperium, the atheistic Imperial truth. Now, this will come to bite everyone in the back like later, but we'll obviously discuss a bit more of it later itself. So as the Imperium began to like grow, and it was the decades were like just flying past, they finally uh, found the Primarchs, which had been lost, sort of launched from terror if you followed our previous uh, episode the birth of the imperium go check that out if you want to and the first uh primark that was found was our main man and sort of the <laughs> well it's very obvious what happens to him it's horus lupercal and obviously named the horus heresy later on you can probably tell how that kind of goes bad he's, and he's a good boy yeah. at first He's, he's a good boy. He's a favorite son at first. Space Horus Joe Rogan does fine for a while. Space Joe Rogan? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like, yo, Jamie, can you pull that up? And he's just putting yeah, up. Yeah. He's just talking to the Emperor, like, yeah, Jamie, can you pull that up? Uh, look at this dystopian going on. What's that about? Hmm. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Have you seen that video of that deer getting hit by the car? <laughs> it's just moved on. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole thing with like his betrayal was because he did a bit too much DMT, and that's why the Horus Heresy happened because of all the visions he had. Yeah, it was nothing there with like the anathema or whatever. It was just the DMT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, some few like uh, notable things about the Primarchs that when they f took over their legions throughout the well, throughout the Great Crusade, they very much molded them into their own image, and when we do like their own videos about. Like what happens to each Primarch and their legion will kind of go into how that was uh, sort of done, how they kind of reformed them. And some main like notable events during the Great Crusade are the infamous Rangdan Xenocides. And we're gonna we're gonna delve into that in a bit, I can't wait. And also two of the Primarchs themselves were expunged from the annals of history. So they didn't actually not all twenty Primarchs made it to the end. Some of them got, you know, tripped up, crawling, didn't quite cross the finish line. There was also the war upon the world of Ulanor, and the infamous triumph of War Master Horus, and the even more infamous Council of Nikea. Mm. If you're probably a history fan, uh, you're probably thinking, wait, isn't the Council of Nikea, you know, wasn't that <laughs> with Emperor Justinian uh, back in you know, back in the day, pre like early medieval. No, this is not that one. This is a 40k version. Well, it's the Council of Kynia. I think you'll find. There we go. Oh god. Mm. And uh, well, as the Great Crusade expanded, the Imperium grew rapidly. It's obviously thousands upon thousands of worlds were incorporated into this Imperium of mankind with the Emperor. But the Great Crusade didn't last forever, and unfortunately, it would come to a close around about. Uh, two centuries in, with the corruption of the Emperor's favourite son, Warmaster Horus. Horus does turn traitor, he is corrupted by chaos, and, I hate to say it, Erebus was there. Ugh, I do despise Erebus. Uh, I do hate, I'd love to hate him, but I do hate him so much. We'll talk more about Erebus at some point. And this uh, ends the Great Crusade as the Imperium turns into civil war, and it begins the Horus Heresy. Does anyone have any uh, questions so far, or any comments they might want to make about the Great Crusade? What was War Master Horus's favorite cheese? Guys, not they don't <laughs> care about cheese. <laughs> <laughs> what about? Oh god, he's probably he he's a cheddar. He sounds like he's a basic bitch, John Horus. <laughs> Nothing I'll wrong with honest. the basics. They're basic yeah, right. for a reason. They didn't, they didn't know we had such cheese puritans on the channel. Yeah, God. Mm, I know, snob. 
Okay, oh, it's the UK. People care it's, about cheese. Not as much uh, as the French, but you know, we're up there. It's it's not really a question, but I like to imagine like as the Imperium's boundaries slowly expand, just the Eldar craft roads like, right, we're staying out of this neighborhood. We're uh we're taking a hard left at the next star system we find. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, Nope, divert. It's probably like it is like playing um has anyone here's done like medieval uh also age of empires 2 like multiplayer Ooh. Ooh. and the enemy team is like growing it's like yo yo stop stop chill chill and they're hitting <laughs> really <laughs> rapidly and you're like i'm just over here trying to mine my gold and it's just like it's getting out of hand yeah, and you and the enemy team have someone who knows exactly how to get to the third age in 10 minutes and 15 <laughs> seconds flat <laughs> I, I did it only a few times and I actually got like, you know when you get bullied as an adult <laughs> online <laughs> so you stop doing something that's the only time I did it oh god Dang. R.I.P. Oh. Uh, with that being said if no one has any more questions or insights uh, shall I head straight on into the expert section boys? Go for it. Aye, aye. Alrighty then so expert time so we begin all the way back to the beginning of our story here with the conquest of terror so this is the 30th or the very late end of the 30th millennium the emperor himself has unified all of terror he's unleashed his adeptus astartes which are the space marines and the last kind of enclaves of resistance are basically quashed no one can stand up to a space marine, let alone even the uh, previous Thunder Warriors who have been purged. And Mm -hmm. at this time, the Emperor sort of spreads his Imperial truth across Terra. This is itself a... I'm not sure if it's an actual book, the Imperial truth. I think it might be like a manual of some kind. But the Imperial truth itself is a... We say atheistic code, but it's not just that. It just includes many parts that deny the existence of things like yeah uh, it's, it's more like a secular than an it because atheism is like um a rejection just, yeah the re- not no it's just the this the n- not acknowledging a religion whereas secularism is more a pro- 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 proposition of the values of not following a religion if if the distinction makes sense i suppose yeah how did the, how did the emperor does, uh, explain psychic powers to people I don't remember. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah, I was going to say that his answer <laughs> was ah, uh, <laughs> souls are. Was it just like you have special genetics? You can cast magic powers, but it's not actually magic. It's like maybe he had those um, you know, those like little uh, devices from Men in Black where this goes. <laughs> like you didn't see me use any psychic powers. Uh, like, from like, what I can tell. Also, go, go ahead, Colin. He's he's got like a PowerPoint where it's like, yeah, I know souls are real, I know magic is real, but gods, no, that one's off the table. That's just absurd. <laughs> Although I know I know in the 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 first few Horus Heresy books, like they they kind of brush off demons and stuff. It's like, oh, it's just like yeah. phenomena from weird like zeals. weird powers we just don't quite understand. Yet. Guy, bro. Just, just a thing, just a silly just little a thing. dude. Just a silly Whatever. dude with. 17 rows of teeth and claws. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about it, bro. You know, it's like that whole thing of like, if you show if you showed people technology in the past, they'd think it was magic and they're kind of along that line of like, oh, we just don't understand it yet. It's just some silly little thing. Don't worry. This is, this is 100% like a Michelin web uh, skit. <laughs> <laughs> um, from what I can tell, though, I think they, the way they talked about it in like the early Horus Heresy slash Great Crusade like books. They describe it more as like a kind of there's like a scientific reasoning for it. So they describe it as like weapons rather than like a mystical art. They don't really uh, understand at the time, or perhaps kept in the dark. Many of the uh, psychers that are living in the Imperium that oh, their belief actually like powers psychic um, powers themselves. Sorry, powers powers. <laughs> I mean, is it more like they're just saying, oh, it's it's more like the X Men, like it's a mutation, it's it's not psychic yeah. powers, it's just supernatural, not even supernatural, it's just weird superpowers we've kind of gained as a mutation. Don't worry about it. It's yeah, fine. when when there are like aliens in the universe, this is like a this is just a little bit of a step up. Mm. It's not quite uh they're not they're not made it mystical um quite yet. But they, they'll soon find out in soon, in two hundred years they'll find out. Mm. Um so the Emperor begins the conquest of the stars it's a big event and the emperor is actually personally kind of leading this charge out into the 
the you know bringing the light towards the stars even though the stars are light you know he's a he's a contradicting figure shall we say and this conquest begins with the colonies on the moon which are called luna at the time and the colonists describe the attack of the space marines as so like brutal that they say the emperor you know pull back your walls essentially and this was something that got earned the legion the lunar wars their kind of nickname supposedly which the lunar wars will be quite prominent in the uh, great crusade mm. and the emperor also has his communes with the mechanicum of mars this sort of tech priest brotherhood and they believe him to be the omnisire and the omnisire just like a brief rundown the tech priests of mars kind of worship the machine god and like technology itself and they believe the omnisire is like a, a physical representation of the machine god in the universe and they kind of like test the emperor by like asking him to fix basically an unfixable device and obviously the emperor being thousands of years old you know uses his knowledge and he does fix it so like mm. oh my god he fixed the toaster that my waifu toaster well, or they're like, I, w- I want you to get to level 1,000 on the original Pac-Man, and then you can prove that you really are the on the side. And he goes, okay, <laughs> done it. So, mm. yeah, so the um, Mechanicum of Mars, they go, oh, you know, you're basically Jesus. So they ally <laughs> with the Emperor, and they agree to uh, forge like weapons and mass-produce sort of armor and munitions for the enormous and growing armies of the emperor and with his uh, go ahead i do think it's important to uh, note that not all of them went along with this willingly Uh, (laughs) yeah yeah. uh, there's a a schism yeah later uh, initially they uh plenty of them were like this is the omnisaya although plenty others were uh not quite so down with that and were rather forced into that role and that'll come up later in the heresy it certainly does and so with the emperor having his 20 legions of thousands of uh, space marines he has uh at this time no primarchs currently although there is a <clears> slight, <throat> yeah there, there might perhaps be a primarch but we'll tackle that ab in his own uh video at some point but so there's currently 20 legions that have no uh primarch leaders they are led by the space marines or like a chosen nominated yeah, usually it's a lord commander that that would lead them and uh they and alongside the emperor himself you know a fleet full of warships and the custodians the emperor's like personal guard they launch out into the further galaxy and they start to begin their conquest which they actually call the reunification of the colonies of mankind as it's previously uh mankind had spread to the stars and obviously with the age of strife collapse everyone was isolated so it's, it's more of like a uh you know it's like it's like if rome fell and suddenly someone went oh rome 2.0 and then you know it's like i guess it's like emperor justinian coming back to rome sort of uh if one knows their history and i'll pass over to andy to talk about kind of something special that they found as they started to spread out to the stars take it away andy uh yeah so uh during the initial stages of the expanse across the stars uh we mentioned that obviously the emperor hasn't got any primarchs yet however there is a very very close proximity by the name of Cophonia. now Cophonia used to be this uh, mining planet that was full of bountiful riches and minerals you know i don't think it states explicitly what it was but just just imagine you know that scene um in snow white where all the dwarves are just like hammering away at like precious rubies and stuff and it's all shiny uh probably that Lots of gemstones, maybe some stuff to make weapons with, Promethium, whatever. Um, but ever since the Age of Strife, this planet has been completely gutted, and it's now no longer got much value. And what is, what is actually left on the planet is somewhat scrapped upon by a, bu- a bunch of uh, rival gangs. And the gang lords rule this planet with a an iron fist, but also they do they do govern to an extent. And fortunately for Cophonia or maybe unfortunately, a young man by the name of Horus happens to land upon the planet. Now, the, the accounts vary about what exactly happened with Horus's time on Cophonia, because it's, it's kept obscure quite, um, what's the word, quite 
uh, GW don't want you to know too much because the mystery is kind of intriguing. But uh, what we do know is that Horus ascends up the ranks of the gang culture, and after a few years, he manages to become the guy in charge. Uh, the, well, I know I've mentioned it in the podcast before, but I would say he becomes like the Michael Corleone, the godfather of Cathonia. And uh, the Master of Mankind, acronym MUM. So MUM, or MOM, finds Horus. MOM goes, oh, there's one of my sons. He's quite a piece of work. Uh, he's already basically gotten in charge of this uh, pretty brutal gang culture. Um, I think I'll take him under my wing and show him the ways of the universe. And for a time, Horus is the only Primarch, ex <coughs> except one possibly with Orpharius, um, Quick question: who, Does yeah. the uh, does the emperor make Horus an offer that he can't refuse? I mean, whenever he can refuse. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think it's mentioned whether or not Horus objects, or because some of the primarchs go, "I don't really want to be part of this." But from what I can tell, Horus just goes, "Yeah, that sounds pretty sweet. I'll." Uh, yeah, this makes sense. Look at this gold dude who's like seventeen foot tall, and this massive fleet. And I've grown up on this like equivalent of um like the north of england where all the mines are closed like all oh, the two mines chicago. are closed <laughs> is it not <laughs> chicago or chicago yeah it's just like yeah chicago in the 1950s but we've like, i've never even been i just know it's bad <laughs> is it bad colin <laughs> what that chicago sucks <laughs> i mean yeah, you, i just, I just know the reference i mean you've probably been, you've been talking to me long enough <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I uh, I do not have the uh, the kindest opinion of the city I'm nearest. Mm, uh, well, but, uh, you know, the musical's nice at least. Uh, yeah, you know, musical's nice. And to be fair, I'm sure some of it is. I don't live in the in the heartland of the city, as it were. Uh, mm. Some of my friends do swear by the city. Uh, just not my style, as it were. I'm going to continue to make fun of it for comedy's sake. <laughs> well. Either way, uh, Space Chicago uh, or Cafonia, as it would be known, um, was one of the was because it was one of the first places with a Primarch that was found. It was also one of the first places where they started inducting Astartes into the legions. The Lunar Wolves, the 16th Legion, already had a reputation during the uh, unification of Terra. Uh, I believe the citizenry to this day in the universe refer to the Howl of the Wolf as something to be feared because of their reputation, and. Because Horus is now being mentored personally by the Emperor, there's no other Primarchs. He's getting very strong, he's getting very wise, he's getting very skillful at the arts of diplomacy and war and governance. And I believe for about 20, I think it's 20 years, he's the only one who's being mentored by the, the Emperor, apart from <coughs> possibly Arpharius. But we'll just say, yeah, it's just him for, at least Imperial Records, he's the only one that's ever mentioned. Um, and it would the next Primarch that would be found would be Lehman Russ. And I'm just going to go through like a list of the, the order of the Primarchs that are found. So bear in mind that the Lunar Wolves are now very, very capable. The other legions are doing stuff all across the stars. They're all doing great. But without their Primarchs, they're not doing their, they're not they're not reaching their full potential. So the, the first Primarch to be found by records is Horus. The second is Lehman Russ. And Lehman Russ is a stark contrast from this very, uh, you know, uh, sharp-edged but quite suave and charismatic leader to this like barbarian king but you know he's 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 a very good killer and so is his legion so they're quite useful uh, the third primarch to be found is the elusive second primarch we know barely anything about the second primarch do we, does anyone have any tidbits they can add to other than ooh mystery he's, I he's, got thing. <laughs> he's a mysterious isn't he this one was the second was the one that fulgrim said was rather humorless and he also called them a hypocrite <laughs> uh, yeah with that's that's about all the solid information we got on him which is more than the ninth and it's two sentences True. it's uh yeah it was i think fulgrim said he's normally humorous humorless and uh he called him a hypocrite when the second said fulgrim was being vain when he said he could conquer a world with just eight space marines. Mm. Uh, so I, that's the that's the end of the lore. <laughs> I know there's uh, there's been some speculation. Uh, for example, Rogue Hobby said a video about like maybe the second legion was the uh, Rainbow Warriors because of like their ancient Aztec theme, and maybe the Primarch was the leader of them. But 
and it's like this world called Prism, which is redacted. But mm-hmm. it's all unknown. Who knows? It's the Second Legion. That's all. There. That's all we know. <laughs> that's <laughs> for also sure. for some meta history, because in the I think the original 40k, all 20 original legions were known, and the Rainbow Warriors, and I think like the yeah. Valedictors were another one. I th- believe yeah, that's them. Possibly. Uh. So. Um, but that's been retconned away. At least yeah. that being the certainty. Bad. Feels bad. Mm. And they got a cool uh, paint paint scheme as well. Um, but the next Primarch to be found is Ferris Manus, and we've mentioned him before. He's actually like very important as far as uh, mentoring the other Primarchs. Because when you think like, who's Lehman gonna like? I like Lehman Russ, but who's he gonna mentor other than being like, let's go for a drink and then punch someone? Like, okay, Lehman, calm down. Uh, Horus is quite busy as like the the Wunderkind of the Emperor, so Fer- Ferris is very much like the mentor for a lot of Primarchs to follow. Uh, funnily enough, the next Primarch to f- be found is Fulgrim, uh, everyone's favorite uh, uh, hedonist and, right. uh, you know, the only Primarch to ever liberate his homeworld without violence, which is pretty cool. Um, Eli's favorite, we should mention. Eli's well. favorites, yeah. I love my boy. Mr. Versace via 40k. Um, so the next Primarch to be found is Vulcan, uh, everyone's big teddy bear, who uh, is a master forge forge crafter and also... Uh, has a reputation for being just like the swellest guy when he's not burning Eldar children alive, but the swellest guy. Uh, I mean, he's still pretty swell when he's doing that. I don't know. All right, that's, yeah. that, that's rather <laughs> rude. <laughs> child, it was um, a child. Thing is, uh, is an Eldar child like? Do they grow up the same age as like a six-year-old? Is the same as a six-year-old? Yeah, human? she was like sixty, bro. Come on. <laughs> bro, it's still a child. <laughs> we did not score. Oh, man. El- the, um, Metica, Eldar, child. This is uh, this is this is off topic, but uh, <sighs> in the in the in the Damocles Crusade books, a water cast a little innocent water cast Tao is trying to talk down this ultramarine, and she's like, "Would your ancestors oh. and your god be <laughs> proud of you for striking down an innocent unarmed being?" And then Chaos Akarius comes in and kills her, and says, "Yes." <laughs> he just so says awesome. yes and puts his foot through her chest. Yeah, he, he <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I'm liking Kato Sakari a bit more. <laughs> That's quite a move. That's a power move. Based yeah. on Basto Sakari. <laughs> For real. There's a guy who's one of our commenters, isn't it? I Kato Sakari. There's mm, a guy called yeah. Kato Sakari in the comment section. We see you. Yeah, Appreciate he's brilliant. you, man. We love you. Um, so, yeah, the next one to be found is Rogel Dawn, everyone's favorite brick wall. Um, <laughs> everyone's you know, favorite brick wall. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, he would probably call himself a brick wall as well. I mean, I do like his... He gets a bit more personality in the Siege of Terror, but not under the best circumstances. Uh, but again, he's very good in terms of, oh, we've now got our first builder on board. Nice, like, Vulcan crafts things, but he kind of, like, crafts doomsday weapons more than, like, anything else. So... Uh, they fortified um, his personality in the Siege of Terror. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, and, and funnily enough, um, the first emperor to be brought into the fold, because he, he ruled the Inuit Empire. Followed by him, we have another emperor, Rabute Gilliman, the eighth Primarch to be found, who uh, we don't need to say much about Rabute. He's just already killing it as far as things go. He's got the most worlds. He's got his own military, his own civilization. He's smashing it. Everyone, well, Colin loves him a lot. Don't you, Colin? I do. I do. I like um, He's cool. And and having Rogel and Rabute in quick succession is like, oh, brilliant. That's great. Um, <laughs> the Empire building is coming along swimmingly now that they're at the helm. Mm-hmm. And then the next uh, four are, are interesting. Then it's Magnus, everyone's favorite nerd. Um, so we start to understand the magic that's not magic. Um, he's very studious. He starts to uncover some of the secrets of the warp and... And this is when the cracks start to form and the Emperor's like, dude, stop it. Stop. Stop. I told you. No reading after 9pm. You know, go go, go. be like the normal children and play football or something. I don't know. If you do um, it, I'll burn your world to the ground. <laughs> 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 um, oh, and then everyone's uh, favourite uh, uh, goody two-shoe Sanguinius is found uh, from the irradiated planet of Baal. Sanguinius is now uh, now he's in, in play. The Imperium's got a, a very majestic, deific looking person to look up to, despite the Imperial truth. And you've literally got a winged angel in gold, but, you know, to each their own. Um, the next one to be found is the Lion. So we've now got uh, the, the 
the the returned Primarch that's in the news at the moment, but also the best general, arguably, other than Horus. So that's quite good for the Imperium, because now they've got two very big heavy hitters for just... We need something to be exterminated across the stars. Horus can go to the east. Lion can go to the west. And they'll come back and... Uh, everything will be dead and we'll be happy and we'll have champagne uh then we've got everyone's favorite uh i was gonna say edge lord but it's not curse uh perturabo uh, everyone's favorite um man child man child man child yeah expressio um, depressio i mean it's it's cool that perturabo is here but we've already had rogel dawn five primarchs ago so he's already got a lot to catch up with which is oh, probably don't do my boy like that come on i good. mean he's, he's cool and everything but I'm, I'm just saying at least for the timeline like rogel dawn is already like He's already turned up. Ilum has yeah. already turned up. The lions here. It's like yeah. there's kind of less things for him to do now that they're already being like attended to, which I think is also one of the reasons why he gets quite embittered. But you know, we've now got the guy who's like a like a living manual. He's like a living PDF file of I want to build something, get Purty to to craft it for us. Um and he starts he starts um committing war crimes here and there, but also building occasionally, so that's nice. Uh speaking of war crimes, then we've got Mortarian. Um, smelly, you... smelly Rick and Mor Morty. <laughs> Morty, <laughs> <Less> smelly <laughs> than he will be. Uh, terrible hygiene, but greater, you know, uh, chemical warfare. Moving swiftly on. Uh, oh no, we've got Lorgar, everyone's um, favorite uh, choir boy, pious choir boy during the age of skepticism and uh, you know. Religion is cringe, so, uh, you know, to be fair to Lorgar, he does bring a, a lot of worlds into compliance, but not so much through bloodshed as uh, indoctrination, so that's fun. And then the best Primarch turns up, Jagatai Khan, baby! Whee! Yeah, true, real. Gotta go fast, gotta go fast. Um, not much to say other than Jagatai is like, oh, cool, I get to go around the galaxy and kill orcs, nice. Moving on, um, here comes the Edge of Order, Conrad Kurz is next. Uh, adding his baggage to the Emperor of Mankind like a 10 ton brick. Because, um, oh, what is Kurz? He, he brings Wells into compliance and he cries a lot. Um, speaking of crying, Angron is next. Uh, again, comes into the Great Crusade, uh, revving his, his chain axes, covering people in Spartacus. I am. Uh, Sp Spangrinus. I am Spangrinus. Uh, Spangrinus doesn't in. hit right. That just sounds off. No, no, like no it doesn't. <laughs> like a Spangrinus. Spangrinus. It's like roll that around your mouth and It's like Spong a brand <laughs> of like diapers, isn't it? Oh no, <laughs> Spangrinus. Uh, for when you just absolutely miss the glue. <laughs> moving on it swiftly, down, bringing it down. <laughs> I said, moving on swiftly. Uh, moving on swiftly, we've got. Um, Hot topic: The Primarch Cor Corvus Corax is here. He's very sneaky. Moving on, uh, then it's the eleventh Primarch who has more uh, more more presence than Cor. No, I won't say that. Uh, the eleventh Primarch is here. Uh, who, this is the thing: the second half of the Primarchs. It's like they're here committing war crimes. These guys who they they kill things. Cool. Uh, and then finally, uh, Omegon slash Alpharius is found, and that's all the Primarchs. They're back, baby. And uh, because, uh, you know, the Imperium's doing quite well at this point. Um, but there are some conflicts waging across the stars, which are actually becoming a bit of a hindrance to the progress of the Great Crusade, such as the Rangdan Xenocides. And so I will pass it back over to Hal, because uh, this this bit's quite, quite an interesting part yeah. of the law, but you need Primarchs to really, like, sort it out. Oh, just also... On a last note, if you are kind of new to Warhammer, the rediscovery of the Primarchs happened. So they weren't all found in like quick succession. Like oh no, every, it wasn't like a few days. <laughs> they were over like many decades. They were all found. Like even some of the later ones, kind of it was like a century into the Great Crusade. I think that's when the last ones were found. So it, was, it took a it took a while to like you know Pokemon catch them all. Um, yeah. But speaking of the Imperium's Great Crusade, uh, it's big now. The Imperium is enormous. And they've captured many stars, purged many Xenos, <laughs> Eldar, unfortunately. Um, many, yeah, some craft worlds have, uh, mm. you know, bit the dust. Very sad. And the Imperium has expanded to, you know, a, a humongous level. But despite that, the 
there was a, a war called the Rangdang Xenocide, which was happened in uh, 839 M30 to 890. So it took quite a while to get this war finished. And this was uh, probably the toughest enemy the uh, Imperium had to fight. And this is with its mostly full strength as well. So the Rangda were like a advanced Xenos species who, as I said before, it kind of matched almost the Imperium's might. And the Rangda used slave armies of other intelligent uh, Xenos species. So they were pretty like rough, these guys. And they even had uh, some known as the Slaw, which still exists to the modern timeline. And these are known as the Maggot Men, who like weirdly like, devour people and stuff. So they had even like a like a species that powerful they had that like slave collared to their will and uh it's actually kind of theorized that this might be some like lovecraftian like god's influence here like to the level of power that these uh rangdan or rangda had and the war of the rangda or the rangdan xenocides was apocalyptic it was nearly every legion uh was represented at some point during this battle, and it cost millions upon millions of lives, and over 80,000 space marines uh, did not make it towards the end. They were slain, or at some point, I reckon, maybe at they were attempted to like slave the space marines, the Rangda, so there might have been some uh, tomfoolery, shall we say. And this had a massive shift in the power balance of the legions in the Great Crusade, so the Previous First Legion, Lionel Johnson's Legion, they were no longer the most numerous out of all the legions, as they were, you know, the First Legions. So they usually had the most uh, amount of space room before, but this just changed it drastically to where, like, the Ultramarines were now actually the most numerous. I think, Colin, does it like 250,000, like, at the height of the Ultramarines' uh, power? I, I don't know if I believe that... it's. I believe it's something like that i also have that number yeah. in my head so you're not pulling it out like of that. nowhere it's like, it's it's like them and the lunar wolves are in the 200 plus that's for yeah sure. it awful. was enormous and a whole lot of smurfs. actually <laughs> a lot of smurfs and this war was devastating and it actually required the emperor to personally intervene towards the end of it to kind of finish it and Another event sort of that happened within the Great Crusade was around the same time of the Rangdan Xenocides, two of the Primarchs, the 2nd and the 11th, were expunged from the annals of Imperial history. And these are often referred to as the Lost and the Damned. And there's obviously a heavy amount of speculation about what happened to these particular Primarchs. They are very much like completely mysterious we only get like snippets of them from the law and even the memories of these primarchs were partially white from the uh still existing primarchs minds they can kind of recall like the full like the fulgrim common uh column where like he could recall what he was like but then like some of them had their names um like white from some memories like even their statues that were on terror they were I destroyed do like that they they didn't go oh we're just going to wipe everyone's memory they're like we're going to wipe everyone and we're going to leave like a show of they used to be here like why not just get the statue plimps out of the way as well and then you could really forget them it seems a bit weird to just be like a bit of a troll and go <laughs> we've still got the plimps here like why just it was like is it um or don't i think gilliman does he say like in the 40th millennium when they are creating the primaris he says to uh call like don't touch their gene seed and it's like there's nothing wrong with their gene seed like call says and responds but he's like no these two failed so they're in like mm. they even the way like they talk about the traitor primarchs that they like betrayed but gilliman states that those two primarchs failed in some way and yeah and there's even that bit where um horus alpharius and jagatai i think are, are having yeah. a, a chat they with Malcador terror. In there, and then it leads to malkador like Force choking horrors, and <laughs> it's like, oh no, don't mention them. It's really bad. Yeah, and as I think at most we can get, I think Horus tries to whisper one of their names, and like Magador just like no, like woke eyes, and just goes, "Not today, Sunny Boy." And oh, Magador being the advisor of the Emperor and a very powerful psycho, if you're new to Warhammer. And there's also a slight bit of information where they, it was I think 
during uh, upon terror in the vaults under the Imperial Palace, which are guarded by the custodians themselves, there's a certain prisoner called Subject Eleven, and apparently that this is uh, like some hints that this might be either a Primarch or maybe like the body of a dead Primarch. We're not really a hundred percent sure, but so the, this point during the Great Crusade, it's very much like oh. There's a you know there was twenty and now there's eighteen and like two whole legions are gone, and again it's not quite the grim dark future yet so it's not all doom and gloom but it's still a bit of a uh, there, there's some showing of how the emperor operates and how he's very much like a oh the the, the stain couldn't exist and but the great crusade was not uh, fully hampered there after the Rangdanzi in the sides in fact uh, someone would start to be more ascendant. And I'll talk, also I'll hand it over to Andy to talk about the next stage of the Great Crusade and the rise of Horus. Well, at, th at this point, as you mentioned, um, some some of the uh, the pedigrees of certain legions have waxed and waned because of the Rangda. Like, for example, the Dark Angels were the first legion and they had the best toys, they had the biggest guns, and because they were sent into, into the Rangda Xenocides, and the, it's like such a hazardous place, they got completely broken down, especially when you consider for a while they didn't have their Primarch. But Horus has been there from the beginning. Uh, he's always more... If you think of the timeline of the Lunar Wolves, pretty much the entirety of their service, with a slight bit at the beginning, he's been there. So they've always been in their prime. And by uh, the dawn of the 31st uh, millennium, so, you know, the Imperium's doing quite well, we've got rid of the Rangda, yay! We've got all our Primarchs, yay! Oh, what's that? And, um, unfortunately... Because of all, possibly because of all the the, the extermination that the uh, Imperium has been doing across the stars, some of the civilizations keeping back a certain Xenos race have uh, not been there to stem the tide. And at this point, the Ulanor Crusade is is launched at zero 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 point M thirty one, where the Orc Xenos have exploded in populace. Now we're talking about the single largest Orc wave of you know virulent levels of armies the galaxy has ever seen like there's never been this many orcs ever in imperial records and it takes every single legion millions and millions of uh, imperial guardsmen countless fleets of navy ships and auxilia to combat the threat uh but primarily all the legions are, are pushing the orcs back to wherever they came from and eventually they corner them at the ulanor system Primarily, the Ultramarines and White Scars start, uh, you know, clipping the wings of the Orcs uh, in the Ulanor system until they find that the, the primary location where their war boss, Erlak Erg, is located is on Ulanor Prime. At this point, the Emperor says, right, I've had enough of these Orcs. Horus, Gavia, Luna, Wolves uh, will get 8 million Imperial Army uh, soldiers, and we're just going to, you know, invade Ulanor Prime. Uh, fun fact, this is the planet that will one day be known as Armageddon. So the Emperor, what, with Horus at his side, invades Ulanor. And it's massive. We're talking, yeah, like 100,000 Astartes, 8 million Imperial Guardsmen, thousands of Titans. And it's a huge battle. And eventually they, they locate this uh, this kind of, uh, I guess you would call it like a, a, a shrine or a, a, a tower, where Erlak Erg and his lieutenants are... Are, are basing their HQ. And so Horus goes, right, I'm going to end this. He teleports with his Justerian elite bodyguard onto the Spire and confronts Erlak Erg. Uh, with the aid of Ezekiel Abaddon in, and the Justerian, he fights Erlak Erg. He eventually cripples him so bad, he hefts him over his shoulder and chucks him over the edge of the ramparts of the tower until he just splatters on the ground at the base of it. Um, he finds all of his men other than uh, Abaddon are dead, uh, but the, the battle has been won and the orcs have been completely routed and without their war boss they completely panic and start you know, getting butchered by any of the lunar wolves still present on the system. Now it takes about a year for the remaining uh, planets around Ulanor to be... Um, should we say retaken by the Imperium? So all, all the all the legions chip in and start retaking planets. The Lunar Wolves, because they've won the main battle, are going. Yeah, we did the most work. We've we've taken the most planets. Because why wouldn't they? And as a show of um, recognition for their work, 
the Emperor says, right, we're going to have a massive parade on Ulanor. Uh, so the Ulanor Triumph is uh, taken upon Ulanor Prime. The Adeptus Mechanicus, like, flatten the entire area. They, they like, they basically just, kind of, like, concrete bulldoze, make it nice. They make a huge pavilion, a huge statue for the Emperor and Horus. They make it really, really over the top. It's like, uh, I think it's something like 500 kilometers of granite that they place out so they can have oh, a, a gigantic Lord. parade like yeah we're not nice. going we're not going like small we're going to have a huge parade with every conceivable regiment every legion and a bunch of uh the all the primarchs are invited apart from the two that were you know censured but they don't count uh oh, sorry so they, they don't count <laughs> They, they don't count. All of the um, Primarchs were invited. All 19 that were originally created. Mm -hmm. Yes, 19 of 21. Um, or is it 18 of 20? Wink, wink. Um, They're but, uh, but, in the naughty corner. They're not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but to, to be fair, some of the some of the Primarchs are busy. They they already have a previous engagement. They're like, sorry, sorry, Dad. Uh, me, and my, me and my girlfriend Shannon are going out tonight for dinner. Uh, we Shannon. can't make it. Yeah, um, Shannon. I which don't know which said that. You, you have the to lion. The lion. The lion. The lion. Said, yeah. The lion can't talk to girls. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you never see her because it didn't go very well. Um, so, yeah, but but of the Primarchs who can make it, uh, Horus, Sanguinius, Mortarian, Magnus, Angron, Jagatai, Lorgar, Rogodorn, Fulgrim, and also Malkador and Constantin Valdor are there for the the big uh, the big gathering. And they have a lovely time. Um, there's also some uh, Sisters of Silence being represented, some Warlord Titans and their Legios, because they were obviously very important, killing hundreds of thousands of uh, Orcs under their boots, and all the respective Legions for all of the Primarchs who could attend. Uh, and some and some Primarchs send like a small detachment to be like, hey, uh, we couldn't make it, but here's like some of my men as a show of, you know, contrition. Um, the fact that they all the fit end, on one square... Is, is probably like the <laughs> it's like literally having every celebrity in like mm. the world on like one square you kind of go wow that's the most expensive square technically on in the entire universe i i do like the idea that though again like the first thing the emperor did was like right we're gonna have a big and just he just like bulldozed the entire planet and just got like we need like a lot of concrete and just i know it's in one of the books where they mention about the the proceedings and like the gargantuan scale of like the mechanicum just flattening the landscape and pouring concrete and making all these elaborate statues and everything's like oh that's quite impressive and the, again this is peak imperium this is when they have they have basically overcome the last hurdle for them easily dominating the galaxy um and for for horus's work uh in killing erlak erg and his legion being the legion that that toppled the great menace to humanity the emperor bequeaths him a title uh he calls him the war master of the imperium and he also asks horus to rename his legion not as the lunar wolves but the sons of horus now horus initially doesn't want to do this because he doesn't want he's, he's not too egotistical he's like ah it's, it's a bit cringe but he's like oh and eventually he relents and when they do they repaint their armor from pearlescent white to this kind of deep sea green it looks which way is cooler Teal, some people yeah. also yeah some people also reckon maybe it's like a kind of it's like a slight against the orcs like hey it's the same like shade as all those orcs we like maimed like cool just just putting the salt in the wound um but as as war master uh horus has ascended as the first among equals he is the most important primarch bar none he has you know boundless glory and respect cast onto him and to be fair to horus at this point he is a little bit shy about it he's like oh my my brothers are all great i'm a charismatic guy but i don't want to be in i want i don't want to see them as inferior to me fair enough but again the emperor has uh the emperor has something important to do um in the back rooms he is working on a very very secret project called the webway project and he doesn't want anyone to know about it because it's very need to know it's very very you know, hush, hush. And it's very important because it's going to allow the last hurdle for humanity to be overcome, which is interstellar travel through the Eldar webway. So he doesn't tell anyone, not even his Primarchs, and he says to Horus, right, War Master, great work with Ulanor. I'm going home. And he goes back to Holy Terror. He takes his men, he takes his custodians, and he says, 
your job is now to lead the rest of your brothers to finish the Great Crusade. I know you'll do well. Kisses them on the cheek and says, bye-bye, I'm going back to Terra. And uh, that's basically the Ulanor Crusade and Triumph. So uh, is there anything you wanted to add, uh, Hal? I thought my favorite part of this is when they're like, you know, thousands and millions of, like thousands of um, space marines and like millions of mortal men that they're all in the parade ground. There's a part where like the emperor sits on like a throne. He's like on the TVs and like they all look at him and literally everybody just starts weeping. Like even yeah. the space marines, like they have that stoic face, but they're like, he's the most beautiful, he's like, like, he's like a m- muck rib. Like, you know, they're like drunk. <laughs> Make a you know that meme? What? Uh, I can't remember what cartoon it is, but it's just like, there's only one cool guy and he's got like the wing mirror and he looks like Oh, yeah, it's from uh, The Grew Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, he's literally the most like, he's like, um, he's like fast food when you're drunk, essentially. Like, that's there's the a whip way in that scene, yeah, isn't there? Where it's... it's like, oh, he's so great. And then he's like, I'm off. What? <laughs> yeah, I found everyone. Freak out a little bit. It's uh, milk. It also, Ulanor has probably the most recognizable art piece about the Primarchs uh, oh, that yeah. you've probably it's, seen. It's, it's where nine of them are standing on that balcony that must be made out of the strongest metal the Imperium has because nine <laughs> Primarchs are standing on <laughs> it. Can I make a slight critique of that art piece? By all means. Why does Angron look like a goblin? It's weird. He's just like a <laughs> little guy, and like you got like these very tall Primarchs, and he's just there, and he looks kind of small and weird. He's he's, he was known to be short, wasn't he? Or like Wolverine, like, like short five king. I think Angron was, <laughs> Angron was like hunched, wasn't he slightly? Oh yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's got his left hand on the rail, like gripping it and breaking it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. He's, like, he's just there, like kind of going, yeah. Like, and, and even Magnus is looking at him, like, what a weirdo. <laughs> also, a bit of criticism, also for that art piece. Uh, not even criticism, just something I want to point out. Half of those columns and like the railing is full of cracks. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, whatever they used for this grant, it was clearly gotten on the cheap. Mm. To be honest, imagine that foreman. That must have been stressful. Like the emperor himself is coming. <laughs> I've got to build oh, a pavilion in five days with five hundred kilometers. Like ugh, I'm not going to be asleep this whole week, right? Okay, roll up my sleeves. Be tough stuff. Tough job. Uh, with that being said, though, should I take it to the next part of the? Uh, Council of Nikea. Mm. So the next, uh, so this is in the timeline where we're about two centuries in. The great, the Imperium is now the preeminent power in the galaxy. Worlds upon worlds have been conquered. Xenos have been purged. And I think they said that I might be incorrect here, but I think they make a quote about. I think there are about two hundred fifty thousand worlds in the Imperium at this point. There's kind of I heard that somewhere, but that's like the kind of level they're at. Obviously, the forty-first millennium, they said like a million worlds. So yeah, the premium does grow. Who knows? I mean, if anyone wants to, you know, critique that, they can go and count them themselves. I suppose uh, <laughs> every world. God, how many of them are named like Terra? Terra one, Terra two, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially when you get like something like just like this planet is called six five nine eight four one F two, and you're like, oh, that's that's wordy, brilliant. Diet Terra. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's something weird. <laughs> Terra light. But, um so the imperium is enormous and it's you know been two centuries of non-stop conquering war and the pace kind of slows down where like everyone i think even jagatai like says in his own book he says i think everyone knows now that the pace of conquest is slowing down it's kind of the last remnants yeah he gets and a the, bit like oh what, what am melancholic. i gonna do oh, there's nothing else to do oh. but funny enough trouble does find its way uh, find its way to the Imperium, and mm. only a few short years after the ascension of War Master Horus, there is there's been a growing tension within the Imperium, and that's the question around the use of psychic abilities, which is using the powers of the warp. And this all comes to a head in the Council of Nikea, which actually happens on the world of Nikea, funny enough, and. Actually, very cool. It's like this, like hollowed out um, volcano, and like the roof is like all glistening and it's like shiny. And the Council of Nikea is a the emperor actually comes back from Terra. Fine, he goes, "I'm off the Terra boys," and then he comes immediately back, like a few short years later. He's like, "All right, let's do this council." And <laughs> like they're all squabbling. He's like, "I leave for ten minutes. You can't be friends. Come on, you can't, you can't even behave." Hmm. 
it just it, it didn't take long and this uh council um is well it's kind of also known as the trial of the thousand sons or magnus the red's legion and magnus the red's legion there a bit of a tongue twist there and um this was a massive like conclave where like most of the primarchs and many of the legions kind of like on Ulnor, their representatives come to discuss the use of psychic abilities continuing within the librarius which are the uh, legions themselves like the uh, space marines who are psychically gifted and this was essentially a versus of two sides so this was a uh, gathering of what was magnus jagus icon and sanguinius who previously like they had figured this was coming and so they penned something called like uh, the librarius code which mm. was like a doctrine of um kind of more a more measured use of psychic abilities within the legions because they knew like the the unrestricted use of it now was yeah not going to last i mean there, there were already people like rogel dawn who weren't they weren't um like savagely against it but they were like i don't trust it and jagatai his legion was very conservative with their use of the warp a thousand sons were egregious to a lot of extents from the uh, the perspective of other legions of how much they used it and the blood angels were kind of in the middle so they said right we'll we'll draft this outline kind of like the codex astarte for psychers and it'll be like here's what you're allowed to do because we know something bad's going to happen and to be fair one of the reasons why the the council happened is because the Space Wolves and Thousand Suns were, were doing a compliance together, and then one of the Astartes and the Thousand Suns started mutating into the Flesh Change, and then several more started transforming into monsters, and then Lehman Russ, like, tapped them, and it was like, what is that? What is... Magnus, what is that thing? And, you know, Lorgar's there in between them, like, going, guys, stop fighting, stop fighting, and, you know... <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me exactly of that video where there's, like, the guy goes... They're like arguing on a lawn, and the guy goes, mm. Dad, Daddy, chill. And the guy goes, What even the hell is <laughs> oh, that? What <gosh. laughs> that one? I like to. Oh, but... Go ahead, sorry. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, ever always like they talk about how like a big of an issue and a trauma it was to the Thousand Sons. And you know, to be fair, especially for Magnus watching your kid turn into that, probably a bit bit of a downer. But imagine be like just the space wolf or the word bearers. He's like, you know, you're fighting alongside the thousand suns. And then he turns into that apropos of nothing. You'd be mm. like, what <laughs> in the name of God? Well, it's it's is not going just that. On? It's just one of them turns and then the others start to follow suit. And they're like, we've got to stop this. This is a, bit, this is a bigger problem than the people we're fighting. Oh, yeah, no. It's like you're just turning for, into um, monsters. Just for mm. reference for you, if you're new to Warhammer, the flesh change is uh, like a, it's a problem like a genetic defect where like it's kind of related to the use of psychic powers and essentially yeah. the marines like skin and body will tend to like bubble up inside and, like they'll explode into like a massive just like mutated if, flesh uh, yeah you yeah. look up a chaos spawn be it the model or the total warhammer dark tide any of those is that and they uh, turn yeah. into that <laughs> and uh oh, gee, i was gonna say on the last section i forgot to ask um I was going to ask everyone who they their pick for Warmaster would have been. Like, if I start Gilliman. with uh, you, Colin. Oh. Colin, who do you think should Gilliman. have been Warmaster? Gilliman. I'd Why listen, is that? Because he's the he's the administrative guy. I know some of his friend, like some of the Primarchs, aren't the biggest fans of him. You don't need to like the general in charge for him to be the best at the job. Like, okay, cool. Your brother Fair doesn't enough. like you. You you're the guy in charge. He's supposed to listen, anyways. I'm sorry. This you, is a uh, military. Oh. Go ahead, sorry, I interrupted. I was saying, like, I'm sorry it's a military and not your frat club, but, you know, sometimes you gotta listen to the guy you don't like. <laughs> what about you, Eli? Who would you have picked? I, I think probably Gilman as well. I think Ooh. that makes sense. Because, I don't know, I like Jagged Tide, but he's too independent. Fulgrim's too arrogant. Robo Dorn is too stoic. Pertorab right, was they... too jerky. Yeah. They mentioned about, like, when Horus was appointed, Rogel was a really good confidant, because, again he would actually work with Horus and be like, ah, I see a problem. And he was so kind of calm and he supported him. He wasn't resentful. Mm -hmm. He was like that that cold water to the fire to the fire of like a forge where he mm -hmm. was like, I can count on Rogel to to advise me, um, which mm -hmm. is quite... But he, but he also said, I think himself, that he wouldn't be the optimal 
a choice for Warmaster because he was too he's too much of a brick wall. Like too he blunt. would he would just yeah. not suit the bill. Yeah. Um I know yeah. Sanguinius is a contentious like possibly point, but again he's a bit too soft. Uh Perdurabo's mm, too harsh. Uh, Ferris Manus is too too savage in how he fights, and the line I think the line would be a good choice, but he I would have to like yeah. if Horus and Dawn work together. I think if you had the Lion and Gilliman together, mm-hmm. that might have worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think Gilliman would have been the best choice. He has no glaring downsides, whereas everyone else has big downsides. No. I think, uh, in my opinion, I think the Lion. It should have been like what they did in Imperium Secundus in a way, where mm-hmm. like. Yeah. One of them is ascendant, mm-hmm. and then he has two advisors. So yeah. one of them is his like his war master, and then one of them is his like builder, like like how Gilliman. Yeah. Or even a... so that's the thing. You you could have a war master, but you could also have an accountancy master, and that's Gilliman. Yeah, I would <laughs> say like there's a, it's that they want to you know complete the Roman uh, influence. I think mm. it was consuls. I I think it was consul. I can't remember the specific name though. So if I'm wrong. It's not consul, but it's what it was. Was like you know, one guy was in charge of the military aspects of Rome, one guy was in charge of uh, you know, at home during the time early time of the Republic. Co-emperors, so could, didn't they as well? That co-emperors. And th- that yeah, that too. Later on, when the empire was a bit too big to sustain itself. Mm-hmm. Although, and it's uh, granted this is ten thousand years later, and Gilliman's had time to grow a bit as a person. But you know, Indominus Crusade, he did pretty well with that, and that was just him. Imagine what he could have done with all of his brothers. Mm. Oh, well, unfortunately, coming back to what would be the a dividing action between the brothers, uh, the Council of Nikea is, I want to say, raging on because it's not like a is it a snooze fest to be honest. In terms of like, there's no war, but there are speeches from two sides. I was saying before, so there was uh, Magnus, Jagatai, and Sanguinius, who are the most vehement supporters and those who were against were Lehman Russ, Mortarian, and kind of representatives from like many other different uh yeah, I think Corvus like, Corax didn't want it either. Yeah. They're like representatives from like different places. In fact, actually I have a list here just of like how they all uh mm-hmm. voted essentially. So Lionel Johnson, uh First Legion, he didn't really favor anyone. I think because he probably mm-hmm. saw it as a tool. He he used psychers in his legion, but he yeah, didn't think that strong. He wouldn't base strategy off them all the time. Fulgrim, um, he was okay with it, but again, Third Legion didn't really use psychers that much. Perturabo, um, against it, uh, probably saw them as weak, or again, you know, iron within iron without using some other ability probably didn't match up with him. Uh, Jack Sai Khan, obviously vehement supporter. Uh, Lehman Russ hated it he thought it was weakness and it was all unclean because it wasn't uh magic that went through the cleansing quote unquote the cleansing uh ritual of coming from fenris so you know good old lehman russ there being a bit of a hypocrite Mm -hmm. um dawn uh didn't really favor the use of it i think again imperial fist didn't really see it as reliable they're more of a stoic type so they wouldn't really yeah they they, they didn't like them but they weren't super in they weren't into it but they weren't like preachy they were just like we don't think it's a good idea they wouldn't use it in their legion but they don't they didn't care about others really um conrad kurz uh he was pro psyker um i'm guessing that's probably because he was somewhat of a yeah. prescient man himself um sanguinius obviously pro psyker ferris um ferris again he's kind of, of a hard head he kind of he was against the use of psychers, but not strongly. He was just like, ah, they're weak. It's hard to headbutt someone when you're doing all that thinking, you know? It's someone, else, it's someone else's thing, essentially. It ruins the concentration. Ang- <laughs> Angron uh, hated it. You know, Angron's dislike, and so the World Eater's dislike of psychers was pretty well known and strong. Gilliman didn't mind in the middle, really. Uh, Mortarian hated it. Obviously, his childhood is trauma from psychers so yeah. Mortarian hated it uh magnus obviously the most strongest uh a proponent of psychic users you know the sorcerer king bathed in psychic abilities horus um he was horus was war master at this time so it's kind of he didn't want to be seen as like favoring any psychs yeah, he'd he swing a, the vote he had to re- he had, a, he had a, like um a relationship to maintain with his brothers so he kind of but they tried to recruit him early on many of the 
sides like before the council came, but then once he was war master, he couldn't pick a side. You know, just as a as a war master, couldn't. Lorgar mm. was pro psyker, not strong, not said to be strongly so. Um, Vulcan pro psyker, not sure why. <laughs> Vulcan's probably like, oh, you know, if it makes them happy, they, they have like the Promethean cult on Nocturne, which is kind of similar. Like, oh, we 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 follow the imperial truth, but we have spiritualism, and uh, they're kind yeah. of flim flammy. Uh, Korax was more in favor of just. Um, the actual trial of the Thousand Suns and Magnus for them like stepping over the blurred lines of Psyche use and mm. Alpharius supported the use of Psychers, but was it even really Alpharius? Who knows? And the Council of Nikea itself was in like a massive like Colosseum, which obviously is quite appropriate. And the two sides gave their speeches. Um, there was a part where the uh, room priest, o- Othea Weirdmake, yep, weird name. As weird make, but um, he actually was previously like a, a friend of Isaac Ariman, the uh, first uh, captain of the Thousand Sons, and he kind mm-hmm. of betrayed their trust. And like, yeah, he... Lehman was like, "Be friends with him, so you can like spy on them." Yeah, so they kind of told them of how like the Thousand Sons use like weird abilities, and they commune with like so called spirits of the warp, and it was like, oh, it's not looking good. But then. Your main man, Magnus the Red, steps up and he gives a, a rallying speech that speaks of the future and how we shouldn't fall to ignorance. And he thinks he's doing really well. The crowd is like kind of flipped now and it's more on the pro saga side. Mm. Until the Emperor looks into Magnus and gazes into his memories and his soul and he sees what Magnus has done. And Magnus himself has been consorting with warp entities. He has yeah. been going beyond what the Emperor told him he could explore within the warp. He told him the warp was dangerous. And at and, this point, he's done a deal with yeah. Seench to try and stop the, the flesh change and Seench went, <laughs> oh, yeah. Although they don't know it's Seench. They don't oh, know no, well, one of his, his subjects, yeah. Is it like, uh, it's not Kairos, but it, it's, it's someone. one of the greater demons. And, yeah. and he's like, I'll stop the flesh change, teehee. And then it's <laughs> only for a bit. <laughs> but... This just, and then obviously, as in many of the representatives from like psychers from the pro psycho legions had come forth. And then mm. once this happens, the emperor just sees that his sons cannot be trusted, let alone how could the legions be trusted. So the emperor declares the banning of psychic powers and the uh, dissolvement of the librarius within the legions. And this just rocks all the pro psychers they all hate magnus a little bit after this like yeah, you motari and everyone's least favorite asthmatic does a little dance and uh, yeah. yeah and uh this again this changes the kind of how the war of the great crusade will now be enacted as they can't use psychic powers but funny enough as magnus was leaving nikea in shame and just not happy with himself he was struck with a vision and this was a vision of what was going to happen to his brother Horus, and I'll pass over to Andy to tell him, or to tell us, sorry, exactly what happened to Horus Lupercal. Well, uh, so during the the Council of Nikea, several of the Primarchs couldn't be present because they were doing their own thing. Like, for example, Jagatai couldn't be there, so he sent Targetai Yusugai, his like advisor for psychic mm-hmm. stuff, and Horus was no different. He was currently uh, doing a, a bit of compliance across the world. Uh, across the galaxy and he happened upon a human civilization known as the interrex uh i believe it was and they're they're you know uh we we're, we're kind of done a lot of our fighting we'd, we'd, we'd like to just bring humans into the fold without killing too many of them so let's do some diplomacy uh and the interrex are like yeah 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 we'll have a chat we'll have a chat and at this time this is this is basically the events of the first couple of Horus Heresy books, or the first Horus Heresy book. And, you know, Horus is loved by the Imperium. He's very charismatic. His Lunar Wolves are the, the gold standard to which all the Legions should aspire to. They've currently been fighting on this planet designated as as murder by the Astartes, where they're fighting these big bugs, and it's, you know, the Lunar Wolves and the Blood Angels and all sorts. And during this time, it's worth mentioning that the word bearers have already uh, joined the forces of chaos in betraying the Imperium. Lorgar's already gone through his pilgrimage and become a bit cringe. And uh, as a, as a 
As planting a seed of betrayal, he asks his first chaplain, Erebus, to uh, to be the advisor of his legion to accompany the War Master during his compliances across the stars. Now, during the meeting with the Interrex, uh, Erebus kind of saunters off, and uh, he, he kind of steals something from their armory of ancient and weird and wonderful Xenos artifacts and weapons. And he he takes their most most heavily guarded artifact known as the anaphame sword which is this big kind of crystalline jet black sword um and it's it looks very primitive but it has obviously some kind of great power to it and behind the scenes he uh he is he kind of he escapes und undetected the interrex go um i know we're going through you know a bit of a parlay right now but um there's there's re something really important missing from our armory uh, Horus, you wouldn't happen to know anything about that. And Horus at this point is going, I didn't do anything. What? Armory? And yeah, the, the, the peace talks sour, uh, conflict arises, and the Lunar Wolves are slap bang in the middle while Erebus starts, uh, starts his uh, plotting behind the scenes. Now, during all of this, uh, it's worth mentioning that Horus had a very uh, close relationship to a... Uh, an agent of the Imperial uh, Administratum and uh, military called Eugen Temba, who at this point was a planetary governor. And they got on well, as well as a Primarch and a mortal human could be getting along. And Erebus, you know, goes to the planet of Darwin, which has been recently conquered by the War Master, and goes, hey, Eugen, here's this really important thing. Keep, keep an eye on it for me, would you? And I don't think it's mentioned exactly how this happens, but... I guess through the influence of the Anafame dagger, Eugen becomes slowly enthralled by the plague god known as Nurgle. And it doesn't take long until Eugen becomes this bloated, necrotic, zombie creature thing uh, that is now in control of the entire Davin population. And as such, the planet completely rebels. There are zombie thralls in the streets, eating people alive. And at some point, Horus hears words that Darwin has rejected the uh, the Imperial truth and they are rebelling. So he sends his Lunar Wolves to investigate. He goes down on the planet and goes, what is going on? What are these zombies doing around here? And eventually he, he figures out where the, the power, the source of the power is emanating. And it's the big uh, administrative you know, palace, the, the seat of governance, governance, and he finds Eugen Temba completely transformed. There's a really cool piece of artwork I'll put up on the edit where it's just, you know, Eugen with the sword and he's all bloated and he's like missing his, a lot of his face and he's like, Bleh. and he goes, he oh like, no. Um, is he like um fat bastard from uh, Austin <laughs> Power? He's like, get in my belly. Get in my belly. Uh, <laughs> he's pretty grim. Uh, for some reason, he reminds me more like, um, like something you'd see from like left uh left for dead or something like a weird zombie special little special infected kind like, of weird um, thing i was to the one uh oh, i just final no, they did a remake of it at the recent zombie game uh, and it's got like um oh my god i'm drawing a massive blank it's oh my god what's the name of the game and it's like they have like um it's not the resident evil that's it and oh, uh, right is that something from like Resident Evil? Almost? Yeah, you could imagine this guy being like Resident Evil as like a weird special infected. Um, but either way, Horus goes right. I guess I'll have to kill him. There's obviously something weird going on. It's no big deal. He's just a, he's just a corrupted baseline human. I just like swipe him with my uh, lightning claws, and this will be done. Unfortunately, uh, during the killing blow he deals to Eugen, Eugen drives the Anaphame dagger straight into Horus's shoulder. I believe it is, and it goes really deep and it penetrates the skin. It, jabs into his arm and he goes oh ow i'm a primarch i've never felt pain like this before and he goes into a coma and at this point uh the the advisors to the war master the mornaval which are like the elite uh gathering of advisors drawn from the captains of the the sons of horus legion they're freaking out you know abaddon's there garviel loken uh like headless chickens a little bit yeah, yeah they're like oh god dad is da dad is da <laughs> dad daddy's is down dad daddy's is down. dying daddy's yeah. dying guys what do we do <laughs> yeah and they're like they go to they I go know. to the vengeful Jeez. spirits they're like um hey nerds in the apothecary dad's not waking up what's the deal and the apothecaries are like, I've never seen a wound like this before. I don't know why they're German. It's like, I have never seen a wound like this before in the Primarch. He is not waking up, no matter how many steroids I give him. And um, 
again, I don't know why the accent. And all of a sudden, um, Erebus saunters in with a shit-eating grin and goes, um, oh, Horus is looking a bit, you know, a bit, a bit pale these days. Oh, ah, it's a shame we can't wake him up. Why does you remind me of the uh, bit from Family Guy where like, he hits his shin and he goes, ah! <laughs> <laughs> in the ah. Shoulder. Horus hit his shin really bad. Mm. <laughs> Out for the count. And basically, Erebus goes, mm, have you tried everything? And they're like, yes, Erebus, we don't like you, but we've tried everything. Shut up, go away. And he goes, I might know one way that we could we could sort out your Primarch and the like. Oh, go on, tell us. So it's like, oh, I don't think you want to know. It's a bit <laughs> of a risky thing. I don't know. And it's like, Erebus comes and say, I don't know. It's kind of against the imperial truth. I he's so got his hand, like his fingers are oh, laced man. behind his back, and he's kind of like pivoting yeah. on his foot. He's, he's doing that thing where he's like rubbing the the, the base of his foot left and right, and going and shaking his head back and forth. I don't know. He, it's kind of sussy, guys. Yeah, that, and that's the kind of way he would say it. It's like, I don't know, guys. And eventually, like I guess Abaddon like points a bolter and goes like, "Tell us or shut up." And he goes, "Okay." Right, you know Davin, the planet where he was wounded. Um, rumor is there's this uh, this uh, this serpent lodge on the moon above Darwin, I believe it is, and there are these weird shaman people here. And I don't know about you, it's not like the apothecary is doing anything. This is probably the only other thing we could try. Let's go to the moon of Darwin. Let's go to this weird temple. We already have warrior lodges that the word bearers put in there to begin with. But, you know, it's fine. It's a, it's a lodge. We all have lodges. You're part of a lodge. I'm part of a lodge. Yay. Religion. What? Nothing. Okay. Come in. Uh, let's let's get a shuttle. We'll go how to the... They, how, I always want. How the hell do they lift Horus? Like, do they get a crane or do they, like, do they <laughs> cough, coffin dance him like into the, the uh, transport? Because <laughs> he's heavy. The idea of... Um, yeah, Ezekiel and Horus Axaman doing the the, the yeah the, the coffin dance into the temple is quite good. Um, but yeah, they, they get him there with a crane or something, I don't know. Um, so I dignify, you can imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, they get they take him to the Davonite shamans, you know, they've got these purple eyes and they're a bit weird and they're like, oh, I don't know about this, guys. And Garvey Loken and um, Paul Gadden, who are members of the Mourn of Allah, like, we're not, no, mm, that's... Mm, mm. No, that that's that's a bit sus, bro. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be part of to this. And uh, they take him to the the shamans. The shamans put him into a ritual, and during the ritual, Horus is kind of subsumed by the the warp. And within the roiling tides of the warp, he's confronted by the ruinous powers. And they go, "Oh, hello, Horus. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, we think your dad's a bit cringe." And they show him all these uh future portents these visions of a, a dystopian future where you know there's throngs of people doing hard labor under the lash of the whip and there's big statues of the emperor looking down on them and they're worshiping worshiping him as a god and there's all these servitors everywhere and it's dystopian and there's clouds and terrible music in the background and horace goes oh this is dreadful you know very grim dark some reason what the hell yeah very grim you know and uh, he has no idea that he's basically the cause of all this. And he goes, oh, no, this is really bad. And, and Magnus at this point kind of intervenes, I believe, as like a, a wolf. He like projects himself as a weird wolf in this like forest of like this trip, this bad trip that Horus is happening, ha having. And he's like, oh, there's a one eyed wolf. That's weird. And he's like, Horus, don't do it. It's a trap. It's bad. And Horus goes, I don't know. So it looks pretty bad for a future and it kind of makes sense and dad's not telling me what he's doing on terror so i assume it's this is the this is what's going to cause it. he's doing some weird thing on terror that's going to ruin the world and the galaxy as we know it okay i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do what they say and the the ruinous powers basically promise him hey look you kill the emperor you can remold the galaxy in your image you can take control We'll just be happy that the the anathema is gone and we can thrive, and you can remill we, you can remold the galaxy in your image, and it'll be, be it'll be better. Yeah, cool. And so Horus wakes up, and now he is the reborn Primarch, the reborn War Master of Chaos, Horus Lupercal, and he will then go forth to plot the the first opening stages of the uh, the Horus Heresy. But just before he can do that, Magnus the Red reeling from this quick interaction he's had goes damn i've got a, i've got a warm dad i've got a warm dad he projects his mind to holy terror he tries to contact the emperor he gets to the palace it's like spirit form gets to the paris palace and he goes There's like a wall here 
Why is there a wall? They didn't used to be a big wall here, like a psychic barrier. Oh well, kicks the front door in with some with some help from his warp friends. Completely ruins the webway project that the emperor has been doing in secret. Um, the emperor's not happy. He goes, "Oh God, what have you done? This is like the biggest, most important thing I've ever done." That's ruined, and there's demons everywhere, and they're messing with the decor. Right, we're going to have to go censure the Thousand Suns. And then that's basically setting the table for the Horus Heresy, where everything comes crashing down with a plum. Uh, unless there's anything I've missed, Hal, is there anything you wanted to add? I just had like the ridiculous image of like the Chaos Gods are like trying to corrupt Horus, and they just go. Oh, we'll show you the Emperor's secret, and it just pans like a video, like the Emperor's like dressed up as a bean tuber, <laughs> and he's like, oh, oh, God. God. "Welcome back!" Oh Welcome my gosh! Back. Here we're gonna open it. It up wasn't even me that. this time. <laughs> and he's like got cat ears on, and Horace goes, "No, this yeah. cannot be." <laughs> Jeez. The Emperor's well, selling his bath like. water on the uh, on the webway. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> oh Jeez. God! Yeah. Um, I said when uh, the thing I will add is when Magnus breaks the uh, webway sort of psychic barrier and he rockets through the uh, webway itself into the portal that's underneath the Imperial Palace. Uh, when he appears in front of the Emperor, this is like Magnus's soul for if you're uh, kind of new to Warhammer. Because he's projected his soul to help save Horus and. That didn't work, so he again projected his soul across the uh, galaxy towards Terra. And when he appears in the throne like room, he's like a burning, like effigy kind of figure. And the custodians and like uh, imperial, like you know, the guardians of the emperor, they don't recognize him as like a primarch. They just think of him as an enemy. Like, what is him. that? Yeah. What is that? And Magnus just goes, "What have I done?" Because he starts to hear mm. like the screaming horde of the demons behind him. He's like. How the hell, yeah, you know, Magnus, for people who don't know, like, is very arrogant. And he never could believe that he'd be tricked into doing something like this. And uh, even he thought he could save Horus by like defying the Edict of Nikea and using his psychic powers to project himself to save Horus there. That's yeah. uh, the Emperor's like, What did I just say? <laughs> Stop yeah, using so psychic he, he didn't get to explain himself, Magnus. And then basically, all the Emperor saw was, Wait, so you used your psychic powers against the Edict of Nikea and then just and broke my favorite to. toy. And I know you've already been talking to like demons in the warp. Uh oh, here we go. Kill him, kill him. He's gone too far. Yeah. yeah. So heresy begins. That's all I'll say, other than the comment of the Emperor being a VTuber. Yeah. What about Colin? What's your uh, thoughts slash opinions? Uh, Magnus did everything wrong. True. And, uh, I've been trying to think of a, a way to keep that horrid train going, uh, but I couldn't think of any apt comparisons mm -hmm. for the VTuber thing. Uh, other than <laughs> if the Emperor was a VTuber, who would he be? <laughs> I'm not answering that. No, that's pretty wise. I'm not answering that because my knowledge is. I'm not. I'm. I'm keeping. Yeah. I'm, I'm keeping that on lockdown for when Andy gives more bullshit quiz answer <laughs> questions. I like the idea that you're like amassing like, like rounds of ammunition to be like when the moment is right. <laughs> it's like what, what about it, like, um, the sleeping what giant you? of America in World War Two? I'm boarding my weapons. <laughs> oh my god! What about you, Eli? Though, because you obviously you. You're very much a supporter of the uh, the idea of like the being, you know, the false emperor, death to the false mm -hmm. emperor. Any oh, main area about Magnus in general, or just like the corruption of Horus, maybe even the Great Crusade. I... Uh, well, Magnus yeah, was pres... wrong. I'll say that Magnus deserves way more hate in the community. Yes. Everyone's hating on Perturabo and Fulgrim, and you're well, I mean, freaking I, Magnus I, I, and Mortarian over here. Like, what the heck? I, I, mm. I could agree, I could agree with Fulgrim needs less hate. I think Perturabo is quite. Quite in a comfortable level. <laughs> yeah, he did kill his adopt his like uh, sister figure as well. Like, uh, it's kind of hard to empathize with you anymore. He bit. is he is definitely a psychopath, but he's cool. There is one thing about Magnus and the Emperor specifically that always bugs me, which is that like he, like he tore open a port a hole in the webway thing, right? Like that's you know that's why the Emperor yeah. was not very happy with Magnus. That and the whole sorcery thing he used to get there. Would it have been that hard for the Emperor to just 
look at the other end. It's like the hole's already been ripped open. You you can't put the wall back up. You might as well peek outside and see if Magnus is right. Like, surely that's something that's at least I mean, worth looking into. I know this is an analogy, but I imagine if, like, you had, like, a son and you were, like, doing a project in the study and all of a sudden he crashes through the room and then, like, there's water leaking through, like, a, a lot of water... Like, I would, the first thing I'd be doing, like, plug the hole, plug the hole, get out so I can plug the hole. Like, and the hole is not war, like, I, the hole words, is like demons. demons. It's demons eating I, people. And, like, going, <laughs> bleh, like that, I, I think that would be, like, all of my cognitive powers. Like, plug the hole, plug the hole. I, I, there's, like, a billion people under the planet. Oh, no, plug the hole. It's da it's dangerous. I guess People's that's fair, but the news my son brings to me in this case is my other son is trying to kill me. I feel like that's at least worth slightly more than send my third son to go deal with the second son i the, feel the like that's is, worth an intervention the thing is the emperor did did say lehman bring him to terror we need to like put him on trial so he can explain himself it's only because of horus that they get slaughtered so i mean in a way that is what i mean yeah, basically it's just like did my thing is like sure if magnus can psychically project himself surely the emperor can too why didn't he just do that and like have a little like peek, like oh this is going on with Horus, or what? What did, what did Magnus find? Let me read his mind because I'm the emperor. The emperor couldn't leave the golden throne because he didn't need, mm, to, yeah. he didn't need to leave. Like, just, a, just a psychic projection. No, that no, because once the web wave was burst, he sits on the golden throne and uses his psychic power to hold back the tides of demons. Yeah, you could have like push him back. Could have spared just a little bit of energy. Just go look. I Not mean, that's him to go. The just look. We wouldn't have the Horus Heresy then. Yeah, at point. I know we wouldn't. <laughs> I don't know, my, my, my assumption is that it's probably like if I if I like try to also contact Magnus, something might slip through, and then oh no, we've now got like demons across the planet, and then maybe and some the of my custodians will get killed, and maybe loads of pop. Nah, I gotta I gotta commit fully. So we can bring Magnus here. So it's just like okay, I'm hold like like one hand on like the burst seam, like okay. Now explain yourself. <laughs> you know, just like leaning against the wall where the, the puncture is. Like, okay, while I'm doing this, tell me why you did this, and maybe you can help me like seal it forever with both of our power combined in like proximity. But again, like we we'll never know. We'll I think that know. it's simply more of the emperor being incapable of coming down from his high horse and allowing anyone else to pick up the slack. True. Inquisitor. I'm, I'm dialing my Inquisitor right now. I'm zero, zero, zero. Uh, with, uh, Death was a false beast. emperor. <laughs> I, do have, I did have one more thing before you end. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you, what's everyone's favorite uh, minor Xenos civilization that the Imperium fought against? Ooh, do you have? Yelda. <laughs> All right. Nah, that's, 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 that's just being spirited. Resist. Oh, man. That's his favorite, though. So that's one positive. Yeah. I'd say the. Uh, Probably the slaw, the the maggot men, because they're pretty terrifying. Like they just devour like people's brains, and then they just like they look at you like hungry, and they just like skitter over to you, and they literally just like suck you up. I call mm. it that's why place. one of the primarchs was um was banished, just because he kissed one on the lips <laughs> with like long tongue. They're like, Ugh, get, get, him, get him out of here. Yeah. What you call I quite like the uh, the Rangda, uh, partially because I like the idea of just. Like it makes, it always makes the universe feel more full when there's another like big player on the block. Like obviously they were destroyed and defeated, but just like just the Xeno civilization, like they're not related to really anything. They're just here. You know, I like when it's as a sci-fi universe. I like that <laughs> they're, they're just a neutral faction. <laughs> they're just then maybe not even neutral, but just like they're just these Xenos that are large and in charge. It took three wars to kill them down. And that's also why, because they're very, uh, they're in a way, they're like the Carthage of 40k, which doesn't have too much inspiration in 40k, but, you know, that's like, there, there's a, there was three Punic Wars, three wars to defeat the Rangdon, uh, the slaves that the Rangdon used, kind of similar to Carthage employing mercenaries against Rome. I quite like them. Oh, I never saw it that way. That's yeah. quite interesting. Mm. Quite, mm. quite like my Rangda. Hopefully they'll make a book about it, or they'll, they'll do more. I doubt they will, but like, that would have been cool. I um, never know. I mean, how many times were the Thunder Warriors killed off for real, and then they kept showing up somewhere <laughs> else? True. I haven't even read the uh, uh, 
the book about like, the last few survivors. I think you have Andy. Which one's that one? It's called. Oh, um, is that the um? Is that the lost? Uh, not the lost and the dead. That's the uh, the the something dead. The um. Outcast dead, yeah. Outcast and Usha, dead. It's not Usha. It's a cool it's book. It's like a yeah, Thunder cool. Warrior crime well, lord. I would say, I'm in charge. like, yeah. there's there's him, and I know there's like there was a group of them on some prison planet the World Eaters had to deal mm. with, and then there was one in the. I know we're jumping ahead a bit, a bit of a spoiler for the Siege of Terror, but there was one that saved the custodies, and the custodian was like, mm. "What are you doing here?" <laughs> Damn, that's cool. Oh yeah, it's didn't like he kill him? Smash Brothers hit thing. It's just like <laughs> Every, everyone here. is here. <laughs> everyone is here. Yeah, even the Thunder Warriors with their like non-healable cancers. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> what, didn't he kill the uh, Thunder Warrior after as well? I think he did, but I think the Thunder Warrior also might have requested it. <laughs> it's like mercy. Yeah, probably like partially. I think it might have been some stupid honor. My time has passed. And some of it also might have been the horrible rampaging cancer that the man's body was yeah. probably 40% tumor by that point. Yeah. Oh, that's an image. I um, know um, the one in the, the, the book is like trying to find a cure, and I think he manages it, and then he's never been brought up in the universe again. Like, where is he? He's really interesting as a character. Oh, well, I guess we'll never know. He's not a space marine. Mm. He's not what well, main character energy. Um, with that being said, though, that was a general overview of like kind of the main highlights of the Great Crusade. We will be going through the events more um, Legion specific in the coming timeline videos. So we didn't neglect them. Don't worry. But they'll obviously there's a lot to talk about because obviously every Legion was mm. doing something. Yeah. So we're having a dedicated uh, videos to that. And the Emperor definitely being, watches Pippa. There, I got it in. <laughs> oh, no. You got it in at the end. Um, mm. With that being said, though, thank you so much for listening and watching. Um, hopefully that was useful if you're new to Warhammer, and hopefully that was a nice kind of uh, deep dive into the uh, general setting. Maybe you didn't know that if you were into Warhammer already. And yeah, with that being said, thank you so much for listening and watching, and hopefully we'll catch you on the uh, next one. I think we'll be, might be doing some... Uh, we might be doing some chapters or legions. We haven't quite decided yet, but we'll obviously mm. it'll be something spicy. And uh, with that being said, uh, catch you all next time. Take Peace. care, everyone. Well, bye bye. I love you. <laughs>